Miracy. That growth mindset, we need to apply to resilience too, because it turns out it isn't a trait. We can learn to navigate change more easily. And that's where I got really excited because I thought, okay, if these things are skills-based, let's figure out what those skills are. Hello, I'm Melinda Cohen, and you're listening to Just Between Coaches. I run a business called The Coaches Console, and we're proud to have helped over 50,000 entrepreneurs in creating profitable coaching businesses. In this podcast, my guests and I discuss difficult coaching situations, but also challenging thoughts we can find within ourselves when we work with our clients and when it's important to check our own ego as coaches. We all face adversity in life, and most of us know how hard it is to function properly when we're too stressed. Stress usually calls for change, and change is stressful. And as coaches, we're helping our clients navigate and alleviate change. My guest today is a physician and author who shared her advice on television shows such as Today, The Doctors, and other network shows. According to her, we have been told to avoid stress so much that experiencing stress feels like its own failure. In this interview, you'll learn tactical steps to build resilience. And she's also been a guest on one of our other shows at Mir CFM, Course Lab. Today, I'm going to talk with Dr. Gilbawa, MD, widely known as Dr. G. Dr. G is a resilience and development expert. On the contrary to what most of us may believe, she says stress is your asset, that it can build resilience. Now, she's the go-to media expert on creating resilience in your community, your team, even your own family. And as a medical doctor, she has decades of experience helping people to change behaviors in order to save their own lives. She's seen what works and, more importantly, what does not. Welcome, Dr. G. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited that you're here, and I'm excited to talk about going from stress to resilience today. But before we do that, would you mind just sharing a little bit of background? Absolutely. I'm a family doctor, and that means in the U.S., most people have what we call a primary care doctor. I've been a doctor for over 20 years now, and about five years after I finished all of my training and was feeling more confident in my ability to ask patients good questions and understand what we should look for and what things might work, I got very interested as well in what was the difference between helping people get better and helping them feel truly well? I love that distinction. That difference is described in the medical literature as patient resilience, which I will grant you sounds a little bit like a cop-out, like we did our part, the rest is on you. (laughs) But I thought, what if that's true? What if it is patient resilience? What is that? And how do I get more of it? How do I help my patients to get more of it? Now, you also, you've got a new book coming out. Is that right? I do. I do. It's based on a lot of the research that I've done since then. And really, it's focused on how we ourselves can get from a place of stress to feeling less winded, less oppressed, less overwhelmed by the stressors that come at us. Especially in today's climate, like I'm really glad your book is coming out. Thank you. (laughs) Now, let's jump in and start with a broader perspective and begin with definitions for our listeners. Like, how do you define stress? I define stress medically. I define stress as the release of chemicals in the brain in response to what feels like a threat. That can mean in the real world, thinking about what if something bad happened to someone you love. It can happen when you find out that you interviewed for an opportunity and were successful. And for coaches, This is really important to know because stress doesn't only happen to our clients when something bad or something undesirable occurs or when something desirable doesn't occur. It happens every single time they contemplate change, even the good stuff. And I think for coaches to remember this, it's really really helpful because our brains absolutely have a million different functions, but only one purpose. And that purpose is to keep us alive. The good news there is we are currently alive. So that makes our brains inherently a little suspicious or a lot suspicious, depending on your experiences and the situation and the stakes of all change, even the good stuff. Our brain doesn't just have one reflex. 
our brain has three reflexes. So let's imagine that you found out about something you were really looking forward to. You really wanted. You landed a client that you think would be perfect and it's a big job and you know, you're compensated equal to that big job and they send you the email and say, I would like to work with you. Even while you might be feeling excited, proud, relieved, happy, your brain still goes through these three reflexes. It thinks, what could I lose? Because loss is one of the three reflexes. Will I still be able to give to my other clients what I've promised them? Will I be able to still have time with my family? Will I lose my reputation because I won't be able to do this as well as I thought I could? It goes through another safety mechanism, which is distrust. Did they remember what I said it would cost? Did they mean to send that email to me? Are they really ready to sign or are they just sort of moving towards that? And then lastly, even if you're starting to believe, you know, you've reread that email four times and it definitely says they want to work with you. And even so, your brain still goes through a third reflex, which is discomfort. What will the communication be like? And they asked me to try something new and I don't know how I feel about that. And I will have to work with them Tuesday evenings and gosh, my evenings aren't my best time. So those three mechanisms, loss, distrust, and discomfort, our brains click through in order to make sure that this change isn't too dangerous. Now that's interesting. So let's look at the flip side, the resilience piece. How do you define resilience? What's that? Resilience is the ability to navigate change and come through it the kind of person you mean to be. That is the summary of all of the social science language around resilience. It isn't just the ability to navigate adversity or difficulty or struggle. It's the ability to navigate change because like we just talked about, all change is suspicious, all change can be stressful and navigate that change and come through it pointed towards the kind of person you're trying to be. Or if you're an organization or you work with companies, organizational resilience is their ability to navigate change and come through it mission oriented. Okay. That's an interesting definition of resilience. You know, a lot of people just talk about bouncing back, get over it fast, recovering quickly. Like that's what a lot of people associate with resilience. And I love your two parts, A, just the ability to navigate it and to come through it as the person that you want to be with that intention. What would it be like to navigate change and not come through it? The kind of person I want to be. My bank account was hacked during the pandemic. And I had to navigate that change. I didn't choose that stressor. It wasn't helping me accomplish something I wanted, but I couldn't ignore it, right? And I had to navigate that change. It wouldn't have been resilient for me to navigate that change by hacking someone else's bank account. That's not the kind of person I want to be. And also I look terrible in orange. So (laughs) if I'm going to navigate a change, it is only resilient if I come through it aiming towards my own values, my own integrity, my own purpose. That doesn't necessarily mean that I'll end up aligned with all the people around me who have an opinion about how I navigate that change. But my goal as a person is to come through it how I'm trying to be. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that intention, that consciousness as you're moving through it. Now, I want to talk about the role of vulnerability within resistance. Can you talk about that a little bit? There is a necessary, and I would say it's two parts. First, there you have to have some insight that you're going through a change. You have to notice, right? And we can probably all think of coaching clients who are moving so quickly or are so stuck maybe in loss or distrust or discomfort that they don't notice that what's happening here is change. So you need that insight. And then to be able to navigate it, and this is where we get into the research that I've done for the last several years for this book. It turns out that when we say resilience, what we're talking about are eight different skills, any of which help us navigate change more easily, help us get through. By the way, we cannot avoid noticing loss, distrust, or discomfort, but we can navigate that more quickly and more easily and get to the next part of the cycle, which is choice. Just remembering I have choices and then figuring out what those choices are, engaging with those choices. That allows us to reunify with that that kind of person we're trying to be. Those eight skills that make up resilience require vulnerability because you can't set out to do something different or better without owning the fact that it's not currently going so well. I love how you framed that, like these eight skills require vulnerability. And I think a lot of people see vulnerability as 
a weakness when it really is one of the biggest aspects about us, one of our strongest aspects that we can have when we have that courage to be vulnerable and transparent as we're navigating change. I agree with you. I think the problem with vulnerability for most of us is that it feels to us like it uncovers weakness, that it's not necessarily weak to be vulnerable, but if I'm going to be vulnerable, you're going to see my weaknesses. So the idea that I keep pushing forward into the world is usually, I'm fine. It's fine. Mm -hmm, We're all fine. mm -hmm. Everything's fine. Mm -hmm. And so being vulnerable means showing you the places that aren't fine. And going back to what you said about resilience, doing it in a way that you're navigating that change, coming out the person that you want to be with that intention. That's really the only way to get what we want. You know, you, you mentioned in the intro, and I so appreciate it, that I have this provocative, crazy idea that stress isn't all poison. I have to say, as a doctor, I see the ravages of stress on the human mind and body every day. So I don't mean to say that I think it is gentle as a lamb or with no danger, but our brains have what's called, and this is a little sciencey, so please forgive me, has what's called a physiologic range for pretty much everything. And a, a great example of that that most people are familiar with is water intake, right? We need a little bit of water or else we'll die. We can actually take in so much water that we die, but there's a really big range in between where our body can live and a more narrow range where our body works at its peak, absolute peak capacity. That physiologic range and optimal range isn't just true of water. It's true of food. It's true of sleep. It's true of sodium and potassium. It's also true of stress. And so you're saying there's an optimal range that we can function in. So there's a physiologic range where we can survive because absolutely stress can kill us. But if we have no stress at all, that is dangerous. That is actually life-threatening. If we have no stress at all, we will walk into traffic. We will walk empty-handed in the dark through a very dangerous area. We need a certain amount of stress to be vigilant enough to stay alive. And that's a really, really wide range, right? From just enough stress to not get killed to so much stress that you're almost dead, but not quite. That's too wide. We do have an optimal range where we're at our peak performance because we're somewhat stressed, but not too stressed. Does that make sense? Totally. And so it sounds like there's enough stress that's having us pay attention, make sure that we're not taking anything for granted, not getting into a dangerous situation, and that we can be our best in that situation in any given moment. So we have this optimal range. And as coaches and business leaders, this is really important to understand because if as a coach, you take all the stress away from your client, they won't be able to succeed in the ways that they want to. But if you overstress them or you let them, and I call this play injured, Right? If you see that they have so much going on in their life or they're experiencing such a large stressor from some other direction, and yet you continue to really push them hard, then you're asking them to run on a stress fracture or something like that, and it will go very badly very quickly. So as coaches, it's really important to be aware of where that person, because it's different for everyone, darn it, where that person's optimal range is for their performance. And how do you how do you personally, or as a coach, how do I work with somebody or how do I do it for myself? Because like you said, it's different for everybody. So what are the indicators? How do I know where my range is? There are two things I want you to do. One at each end of the spectrum, right? And so first I want to make sure we don't cause any harm. So let's talk about what we do to make sure people aren't becoming overly stressed. So I used the exercise analogy of not having people play injured. If my kids, I have four kids, and if one of them as an athlete is running for a coach and that coach sees my son start to limp while they're doing laps, I sure hope that coach pulls them out, not waiting until he's on the ground screaming. So when we think about that in terms of mental health, which is what we're talking about, I hope that you're already pretty aware of what the red flags would be in your client, because those are pretty similar in most people. Someone who's abusing substances or they're harming themselves in some demonstrable way. Those are red flags. We've passed the point of, gosh, maybe I should take it easy on them. And now we have an emergency on our hands. So what you're asking about are what I think of as yellow flags. How do I know when this person is starting to get overwhelmed, when they're starting to limp? What does that look like? And although it is different for every person, 
you can do a couple of things. If you're an elite coach, meaning I don't mean if you're great at your job, I believe you are. What I mean is if you have just a few clients that you work with a lot, you can get to know what their particular yellow flags are. You can get to know them well enough to know what the signs are. But let's assume that you work with too many people for that. The litmus test is this. Is this person surprising you in either direction, good or bad? Are they surprising you because they're not doing what they said or they're blowing off the times they were meant to meet with you or they're not stepping up to their accountability goals? Or are they surprising you because they're suddenly super communicative? They're suddenly really chatty. They're suddenly telling you all the time how appreciative they are. They've changed their behavior. When someone surprises you, please get curious. Don't get accusatory. Don't diagnose them with something. Just be curious, out loud curious, like this. Boy, Melinda, I noticed that normally when you have a project to work on in the two weeks we don't meet, I hear from you a couple of times. I'm hearing from you each day, and I wanted to ask, separate from answering the questions that you're emailing me, I wanted to ask, is there anything going on that I'm not aware of? Nice. And so it gives that opportunity for communication, for interaction. If I am meeting with you, Melinda, if you're my coach and you say to me, well, you know, you've mentioned three times, Debbie, that you're frustrated, you're not finding the links you need, or you lost your keys. I could tell you for me, losing things is a yellow flag. So you might say to me, this might be a yellow flag that you're starting to feel a little overwhelmed. What can we do to reprioritize or figure out what's going on. And I love even having that phrase, yellow flag, like sharing that with your clients. So you don't have to go into the story. You don't have to go into whatever might be going on. It's just like, Hey, it's a yellow flag. Let's explore this. Some people are unfortunately really put off by us saying, I'm worried about your mental health. So since most people are listening, aren't trained mental health diagnosticians, take that pressure off yourself. Don't spend your time trying to figure out, is this client borderline, bipolar, ADD, whatever it is, you can just say, it seems like something is a little bit more of a struggle than you expected. Can you help me understand what's going on? So that's at the overload end of the spectrum. It's an interesting question, and there's a lot more variability about what too little stress looks like. But you'll know it as a coach because you'll see that they've, at least in words, agreed with the action items or the goals that you have, but they're not getting to it. And it isn't new, right? This isn't a sudden change that would let you know they're getting overwhelmed. They've just never really gotten to it. And then you will know that you haven't turned up the urgency flame high enough. And you don't have to solve that problem yourself. You can say, it feels to me like we haven't found the tasks that you have urgency around to achieve your goals. Right. Now, earlier you mentioned navigating the change more easily and quickly so that people can get to choice. And you mentioned eight skills that can help with that. Can you talk a little bit about that? I would love to talk about that because this was where my research really landed. When I was lucky enough to start working with a doctoral lab at a business school and we said, okay, resilience, what really is it? There are five scientifically validated evidence-based tools that we use to assess resilience in adults. And they ask sort of similar questions in different ways. We aggregated all of those questions into one long list and evaluated them. And we discovered that they were asking about a few traits, meaning things that you just have, right? Like your eye color would be a trait, an example of a trait. But mostly they're asking about skills. And as an educator, I teach medical students every week. And as a parent and as a thought leader, I was like, oh, skills. I love that word because I can learn skills and people can teach skills. Resilience, if it's skills based, it can grow. It isn't, and all the research backs this up, it isn't like your eye color. But, and Melinda, tell me if you disagree. We tend to talk about resilience like it is a trait. We say things like, oh, he's just sensitive or she has a hard time with change. Yeah, it's a lot of times there's a negative connotation to it even, kind of an undertone that comes with it. And it's just like something that you are or something that is. Right. And then Carol Dweck came along and did all this great research to show that a growth mindset is the situation that we need. And that growth mindset, we need to apply to resilience too, because it turns out it isn't a trait. We can learn to navigate change more easily. And that's where I got really excited because I thought, okay, if if these things are skills-based, 
let's figure out what those skills are and then come up with an assessment so that when I come up with ways to teach those skills, I can figure out if it's actually working. So that's my ongoing work is that assessment. But the skills themselves are going to sound to coaches so familiar. So I'm going to run through these skills for you really quickly, just in a list. And I will tell you, by the way, at the end, I'm happy to give everybody a free resource so you can go see what the heck I'm talking about. So don't feel like you have to you know, pull over and write all eight of these down because we'll give you a resource for them. But these eight skills are the ability to build connections, to set boundaries, to open to new possibilities, to manage discomfort, to set goals, to find more options, to take action, and to persevere. And so as we can begin to pinpoint any one or a combination or all of those things, we can learn to navigate change more easily, more intentionally, like you said, to get us to a place of choice. What choices do we want to make? I'm taking notes and my brain is going a thousand mile minute thinking about my own situations, thinking about clients and different scenarios. When things start to get rocky, let me ask you about this. Like when things get rocky and uncomfortable, what do you do? How do you how do you build that resistance in the midst of what sometimes is profoundly uncomfortable as in the change that's going on? The skills that you have to manage your discomfort, I think, are some of the most valuable skills that anyone has. And you already have a lot of expertise. Everyone listening already has a lot of expertise in managing their own discomfort. But we all have coping mechanisms, right? We all have coping mechanisms that are really admirable or totally neutral. And a few that we really wish we could stay away from more often, negative coping mechanisms. Make a list of everything you can think of that you do to change how you feel when you don't like how you feel. So that might be everything from, I scroll on my phone, I call a friend, I listen to music, I eat all the ice cream in the freezer, I drink alcohol, I pick a fight with someone in my family, I bury myself in work or I avoid work entirely. I mean, everything as long a list as you possibly can. And then go back through that list and scratch out everything that's damaging to you or someone else. Now you've got a list of your positive and neutral coping mechanisms. And now I want you to look at that list and I want you to circle all the coping mechanisms you can use when you are in that situation or thinking about that situation. These are the coping mechanisms that are most useful to you right now. But that's not good enough because I want you to grow that list. So look for other positive and neutral ways to manage your discomfort in those situations. And there are so many places that we can gather more ideas, but if you don't go do the exercise, then you'll keep coming back over and over again to the few that you have. And human nature being what it is, we often more and more quickly go to the negative coping mechanisms. And so when you're working with your clients in this way, which I love that question, thinking about What do you do when you feel uncomfortable? And just having this massive list, I just, when I would think about if I created this list, which I'm going to go do after this, because I think it's an excellent exercise, just being in agreement with myself with all the positive things I'm doing and the neutral things, it's like, yeah, okay, so whatever, no big deal. And instead, we, a lot of times we just harp on the negative and focus only on that. And we're not actually acknowledging when we're doing okay with this. Yes. And I'd like to point out that there are a lot of things that if we do them in moderation, they're neutral. My love of ice cream and romance novels isn't dangerous to anybody unless I'm doing that 18 hours a day. So our society has such a productivity focus that we like to say, oh gosh, it's only admirable. It's only even neutral if it's accomplishing something. And that's not true. And because of the Puritan roots in the US, we have a real productivity bias. And in managing discomfort and strengthening mental health, that productivity bias can be really harmful. Yeah, it sends us into that red flag zone pretty quickly if we're not careful. Yes. Yeah. So we got to really pay attention to that, which is why I think it's so important to work with others, have a coach or that guide or that mentor, somebody like yourself that can really help you navigate this because often we can't, we don't even realize it's happening or that we're doing it. That's absolutely true. And I think that one of the reasons that coaches undervalue what they do for people is because a lot of what you and I have spoken about, Melinda, although I hope it brings some people clarity, they're thinking, oh, sure, everybody knows this stuff, right? 
And if they think that, then they think, so when I remind my client about that, that's not my expertise. That's not what's so valuable. And I disagree. I think this is some of the most valuable stuff you can do for your client. Right. And it's often the stuff that we're never taught or never taught well or don't continue. I love what you talked about earlier. You know, this is something that we can grow. You know, when it's skills based, we can actually improve and enhance these different skill sets that you've shared with us. And we can grow and get better. And then the ripple effect. And it's just paying attention to these fundamentals that are so important. I'd like to point out to everybody something that will be a real obvious thing once I say it. And that is the downside of resilience being a growth commodity is that in certain situations, it drops unexpectedly, you know, like the stock market. When something can grow, it can also drop. And as so many of us have seen in ourselves and in our loved ones and in our clients and our colleagues in the last couple of years, somebody can seem to be doing really well and going along. And then for reasons that are either obvious or totally opaque, suddenly they're really struggling to navigate even the smallest change. When that happens to you or to your client, please don't feel that there was some underlying flaw that went unnoticed. Please don't feel that you've been a fraud all along or that person was never as strong as you thought they were. It just means their resilience dropped. And this is a real opportunity to go back to those basic skills, remind them or yourself of your expertise that you already have in navigating change and use that vulnerability to say, hey, I'm going to need my connections more here, or I'm going to need to set more boundaries here, or I need to redefine my goals here because for whatever reason, this is hard right now. Now, you've been talking, you just kind of talked about it here, and you've been talking about it throughout our conversation. How can coaches use these skills without feeling like they have to become experts or pursue a path in the medical field or trained in in certain skill sets? Well, one of the things that I share really freely is the resilience cycle as a download. And I have a two-minute video that I'm happy to send you if you go to my site. What I want you to think about is, hey, let me show this to my client. Here's a resource that I have for you. Let's watch this two-minute video together, and then let's use the resilience cycle. That's that cycle of loss, distrust, discomfort, choice, engagement, and reunification. And then I can say to my client, listen, here's a change that you are going through right now. Tell me all the places that you are right now in this cycle and give them three game pieces, one big and two little, so that they can say, well, my big game piece is mostly in choice but I still have a small game piece in loss and I still have a small game piece in discomfort. And then it gives you the language to talk to them about resilience, to figure out what they need to be able to move their big game piece along and what empathy or what open-mindedness they need to be able to accept that their small game pieces may stay in loss or discomfort for a while. What a great exercise and thank you. And I'll be sure we'll share that resource so that people know where to go to get that. I want to summarize a few things because we've talked a lot in this conversation. First of all, I loved right out of the gate defining stress medically, right? It's the release of chemicals in our brain in response to a threat to change and change isn't bad. It's also good. Uh, Just what is that thing that's causing change? And I love your definition of resilience with the ability to navigate that change and come through as the person that you want to be. We talked about how your brain goes through those three reflexes to make sure that the change is safe. It's got to be safe so we can navigate it. And then you took us through the eight skill sets so that we can really tap into that vulnerability, navigating that change to get to choice so that we can move through it in the way that we want to and that supports us. I love the tools that you shared with us that coaches can use you know, on ourselves and with our clients whether it's how to manage discomfort, whether it's the resiliency cycle, and making sure that we know where's our red flags and our yellow flags. I love when you said, don't get accusatory, get curious. Of course, that's, you know, as coaches, how we show up with our clients and what we do so well, and just to stay in that space with our clients. And even that there's a downside of resilience and to just even be curious with that go back to the basic skills and grow with that. Dr. G, do you have any parting words that you want to add to that? I want you to really think about how this is a skill set that you have. You know so much about your own resilience and how to help your clients navigate change. 
that you could be bragging about this. You could be flexing a little bit about how well you're going to help your clients, the clients who haven't found you yet, to navigate the change in their lives. As soon as you mention it, then people say, oh yeah, change is hard. Well, thank you. And thank you for listening to this episode of Just Between Coaches. And a giant thank you, Dr. G, for this amazing conversation about turning stress into resilience. You can find out more about her and her work and her new book at stressedtoresilient.com. And that's stressed, S-T-R-E-S-S-E-D-T-O, resilient, R-E-S-I-L-I-N-T dot com. Dr. G, thank you so much for coming to the show. Thank you, Melinda. I really appreciate it. I'm Melinda Cohen, and you've been listening to Just Between Coaches. Just Between Coaches is part of the Miracy FM podcast network, which also includes such shows as Once Upon a Business and Making It. This episode was produced by Cynthia Lamb. I wrote this episode with Mishi Lance. She assembled the episode. Danny Eni is our executive producer, and post-production was by Post Office Sound. I encourage and invite you to follow us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you're listening right now. In that way, you make sure you receive future episodes and be able to listen to older ones. If you like the show, please give us a starred review. It's a great way to help us get connected to more listeners. 